So again, today we'll, we'll go ahead and go through uh, the lecture for today, and we'll also go through uh, the lab. So we'll talk about the fermentation and yeast fermentation lab. Um, yeah, should be fairly simple, but we'll go through it. Okay, so the working cell, chapter five. So chapter five is mainly going to be concerned with uh, energy and how energy is dispersed in the cell, as well as enzymes and chemical reactions within the body. Okay, we'll also be talking about uh, solutes, so salts and tonic tonicity, or how the cell deals with uh, various different salt environments. Okay, so um, one of the big things that we, we were talking about last time or during diffusion was water moving in and out of the cell and how it's important, right? We talked about different vacuoles uh, or those compartments where, uh, um, that are very important in plant cells, right? To make plants stand up straight. Um, so if you haven't watched that lecture, please do so. Again, we're gonna be uh, having another quiz this week and uh, an exam shortly. So uh, just a heads up. All right, so conservation of energy. So energy first. Uh, energy is the capacity to cause change or to move matter in any direction. Uh, it would not move if left alone. So energy requires um, it, it requires some sort of a force, and it requires some sort of uh, a loss or a change in either chemical potential or chemical or potential energy. Okay, or uh, kinetic energy. So kinetic energy, energy of motion, moving matter performs. Uh, work by transferring its motion to other matter, such as leg muscles pushing bicycle pedals, right? So kinetic energy, again, is moving, uh, and this is where energy is going to be dispersed, right? Um, so conservation of energy, the principle that energy can be neither, neither created nor destroyed, right? So energy can be lost, uh, created, and destroyed. Energy can be lost in... Um, uh, through heat, right, and combustion engines. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. That's chemical energy being burned in the engine, uh, and then some of it's going to be converted into heat, right? So, and then the other is converted into kinetic energy or movement, right? Um, but again, conservation of energy of equal amounts put in, equal amounts received out, okay? Uh, potential energy, stored energy, the energy that an object has due to its location and or arrangement, Water behind a dam and chemical bonds both possess potential energy. And we'll talk about molecules that our body will store uh, potential energy in called ATP. But remember, this is probably the best uh, explanation of potential energy that I can give you is water behind a dam, right? Also, another, another example would be uh, a boulder on top of uh, a mountain that's about, or a, a hill, right? If you push the boulder a little bit, all that energy will be dispersed out on the movement of that boulder, okay? So that's potential energy, okay? So again, conservation of energy, energy created is never, neither created nor lost or destroyed. Kinetic energy is energy of motion, right? The energy required to cause that motion. Okay, so energy transformation during a dive, right? You have uh, potential energy at the top, so think of this as at the as the boulder on top of a hill, right, about to be pushed off. You uh, trigger that potential energy with kinetic energy, right? You had climbed up that ladder up into, so you transferred your chemical, which was food or whatever energy you're using to power your muscles, right, to climb that ladder to create that potential energy, right? Uh, diving converts the potential energy into kinetic energy. Which is very forceful. Um, and, and in the water, the diver has less potential energy, or you've dispersed that potential energy to the water, right? So when you, do, when you dive, potential energy is lost and converted into kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is then dispersed into the water. And if you jump into the water, you create movement, again, causing that water to, uh, to move as well. Also, friction. Um, and, and uh, as well as the movement of your body through the water causes some small amounts of heat. So some of that uh, uh, kinetic energy is lost also uh, 
on uh, through through heat. Okay. So again, uh, potential and kinetic energies are the two energies that we're going to be mainly concerning ourselves with. Okay. Potential is the ability to perform that 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 movement, and then kinetic is the actual ability uh, or the the movement energy. Okay. So heat. Uh, the amount of kinetic energy contained in the movement of the atoms and molecules in a body of matter, heat is energy in its most random form. Okay, so we consider heat uh, uh, t typically loss of kinetic energy uh, or loss of potential energy through heat, right? So heat is just a byproduct of that energy being performed, right? So think of your car. Um, you use chemical energy, that's potential energy stored in those chemical bonds, the octane or the fuel that we burn through the car, right? Um, and we want to burn that, that, that fuel in order to combust the engine or cause combustion in the engine. Excuse me. And heat is a byproduct of that combustion, right? We, are, we want to turn the, the pistons, we want that piston to drive a shaft or a drive shaft or that car to move the car. Ultimately, we want the car to move, right? Um, but it's a combustion engine and, and we, we're burning uh, the fuels. Therefore, we are igniting that chemical source. We are creating heat. Heat is a byproduct of that combustion. We don't want the heat. We have cooling systems in cars, right? The radiator and the, the fluid system to cool the engine because the heat can, can destroy or damage that car, right? Overheating, things like that of that car. We want movement. We want the use of that, uh, the octane, that energy to push that car. We do not want heat. Heat is uh, considered a random uh, uh, byproduct of the energy that's being used, right? Um, again, heat can be useful, but it's very hard to harness the energy of heat, right? Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to use heat energy. It's typically what we consider a loss of kinetic energy, okay? So entropy is a measure or of disorder or randomness. Uh, one form of disorder is heat, right? So heat is considered that loss or that uh, disorderly form of that kinetic energy, which is a random molecular motion, right? So the hotter something is, the more movement you'll typically have, okay? And that makes sense, right? So uh, imagine you rub rubbing your hands across a, a wooden desk or making a fire, that friction that movement is being converted into heat, right? And that, that energy is being lost uh, through heat, okay? Right, chemical energy. So this is very important for biological systems, right? Not, uh, not just kinetic or potential, but chemical energy will create the potential and the chemical energy that our bodies will utilize, right? So energy stored in the chemical bonds of molecules, a form of potential energy, right? Uh, chemical energy can be extrapolated from combustion of fossil fuels or from organic molecules such as fats, proteins, and sugars. Remember, in organic molecules, energy is stored uh, in the carbon-hydrogen bonds. Fats have twice uh, as many sugars. Fats have twice as many calories as sugars, okay, or twice as much energy as uh, as sugars, okay. So remember, sugars have offsetting hydroxide bonds, uh, whereas fats have nothing but carbon and hydrogen bonds. All right, which also makes fats nonpolar. Uh, only about thirty four percent of energy is extrapolated from your food, right? So humans or or uh, mammals are about thirty four thirty five percent efficient. Okay, so we're not that great at processing our food. Cars are about twenty five percent efficient. The, the rest of that energy is, quote unquote, again, we don't really lose energy, but it's lost as heat, okay, right? So 25% of the energy is actually converted uh, to the movement of cars, uh, and 75% of that energy is, is, quote unquote, again, we don't really lose energy, but converted into heat or lost, right? It would be great if we can convert all of that energy into complete movement, but again, we wouldn't. Then we wouldn't have the need for the radiators. We wouldn't have the need for the cooling systems in cars because, again, we would be uh, hyper efficient and heat would not even exist, right? But cars are only 
uh, uh, 70 or 25 percent efficient, where 75 percent of that that gas or that combustion uh, is converted into heat rather than actual movement, right? And that is true with us, right? 35, 34 percent of that energy is uh, is actually used up in our food. The rest of it is either converted into heat or it's lost to the calories are lost into our gut microflora, right? So, or we defecate it out. There's still energy left in our feces after we've uh, dumped it out. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Energy transformations in a car and a cell in both the car and a cell, the chemical energy of organic fuel molecules is harvested using oxygen. Uh, this chemical breakdown releases energy stored in the fuel molecules and produces carbon dioxide and water. The release energy can be used to perform work. Um, so fuel rich in chemical energy, right? We have octane and gasoline. Uh, again, uh, gasoline mixed with oxygen will, will form that combustion, right? This is why we have uh, air or fuel, uh, fuel mixing with air inside of the combustion engine. And then we have the ignition by the spark plugs that cause that uh, explosion and that uh, turning of the, the piston, okay? Um, Again, that combustion will then convert uh, uh, the energy into kinetic energy of movement, right? So the car can then move. During the combustion process, we have octane uh, with oxygen uh, turning into carbon dioxide and water, okay? Uh, again, that combustion cycle, right? And this can also be seen in humans uh, from glucose and oxygen, right? Oxygen is going to be a terminal electron acceptor, and we'll get into respiration on uh, uh, Wednesday, okay? But for now, it's the same. Think of this as the same process, right? The breakdown or the conversion of some sort of uh, uh, chemical energy or the chemical source being converted into uh, either potential energy or kinetic energy here. So a car is going to be kinetic for movement, right? The combustion or the octane, whereas we will convert our energy into a potential energy called adenosine triphosphate or ATP, which we can then use for uh, uh, kinetic energy, okay? All right, so foods and calories. Um, a calorie is the amount of energy that raises the temperature of one gram of water to one degrees Celsius, okay? Commonly reported as calories with a capital C, which are kilocalories or kilocalories which is a thousand of these little calories, right? So each calorie that you see on a nutrition label can actually heat uh, 1,000 grams of water by one degree, okay? So uh, these are actually kilo calories. So this is a lot more energy than a regular uh, baby calorie, right? Or a little uh, lowercase calorie, okay? So um, these are kilo calories, not true uh, calories. So that is what a calorie is referred to as. All right. So in co a comparison of calories contained in some common foods and burned by some common activities, right? Uh, so here we have, um, I guess, bread and eggs, carrots, and, and uh, it looks like an orange. Uh, that's about 100 calories. And you can burn that off with uh, 30 minutes of walking. Uh, you can burn off a can of soda, which is about 150 calories through cycling for 30 minutes. Swimming, uh, chocolate, uh, again, 200 calories is not that much. I feel like a little bag of Cheetos is about the same. Uh, cake, if you're getting about 300 to a slice of pizza, 300 calories, that's 30 minutes of, of running. And that's actually quite a bit. So uh, um, it's very difficult to burn off uh, some of these calories through motion. The majority of the calories you, uh, you burn is actually through your normal metabolic processes, right? Your brain functioning, your processing of, of uh, different uh, uh, molecules that you consume, as well as your uh, normal organ functions, right? Those are going to be your majority of the calories burned in a day, right? Um, here you have a burger at 400 calories, and some burgers can be even more up to uh, uh, 2,000 uh, I've seen burger meals up to 2,000 calories with like fries and, and extra cheese and things like that. Uh, 
So yeah, we definitely have high, high calorie counts here in the States compared to uh, other places in the world. But um, again, you, uh, you cannot outrun a bad diet. And this kind of shows you how little energy we actually burn uh, when we're doing these activities, these aerobic activities. Um, yeah, very hard, very hard to, to burn that much calories. Our bodies are pretty efficient when it comes to our uh, moving and movement. All right, ATP and cellular work. We have catabolic. Uh, we talked about catabolic functions, right? The breakdown of organic molecules to gain uh, energy or ATP. Anabolic will be the investment of ATP to uh, build the body, okay? So catabolic, again, breakdown to get ATP. Ooh, excuse me. ATP, a molecule composed of adenosine and three phosphate groups, the main energy source for cells. A molecule of ATP can be broken down to a molecule of ADP or adenosine diphosphate and a free phosphate. This reaction releases energy that can be used for cellular work. I know that's a lot. We'll talk about ATP in a little bit. Uh, this, this molecule is actually very similar to nucleotides, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, ADP or adenosine diphosphate, this makes sense, right? ATP, adenosine triphosphate, right? Three phosphates, where, whereas ADP has two phosphates, okay? And I'll, I'll show you an image right now. So molecule composed of adenosine and two phosphate groups, the molecule ATP is made by combining a molecule of adenosine diphosphate with a third phosphate in an energy consuming reaction, okay? And this will be done uh, uh, in the mitochondrion and as well as uh, through uh, uh, substrate level phosphorylation, which is uh, uh, done by uh, glycolysis, which we'll go through later uh, on Wednesday, okay, in more detail. Okay, so each phosphate in the triphosphate tail of ATP represents a phosphate group. A phosphorus atom bonded to oxygen atoms. The transfer of a phosphate from the, the triphosphate tail to other molecules provides energy for cellular work. Okay, so here we have an energy rich molecule, adenosine triphosphate, right? One, two, three. The loss or the removal of this phosphate again can be donated uh, to different metabolic pathways or different. Uh, um, different, uh, uh, I guess, uh, pathways in the cell that require energy. Um, and this is the transfer of that energy, right? Through the, the, the dephosphorylation of adenosine uh, triphosphate, okay? Making adenosine diphosphate and uh, uh, the phosphate being transferred to another molecule. This is called phosphorylation. And you'll see this later on when we get into different pathways. The, this molecule will phosphorylate or add a phosphate to a protein or a different molecule, energizing that molecule, allowing that molecule to actually perform work or utilize different energy strategies, okay? So again, the phosphorylation, addition of that phosphate uh, would be that transfer of the energy, okay? So this is kind of showing you different mechanisms for which we use ATP for in the bodily functions. Uh, this is, uh, myosin and actin, right? So these are different uh, fibers or motor fibers of, of, uh, of a muscle, right? So the addition of ATP uh, to the, the uh, muscle fiber, again, the addition of the phosphate will cause that movement to occur. Once that uh, ATP is used, you have that pushing or movement of that muscle, okay? Um, causing that contraction, right? So ATP has, uh, helps contract uh, muscle fibers, All right? And again, you see here the ADP and the extra phosphate is bound to the myosin head and the actin filament, uh, causing that stroke of the muscle, right? The contraction of that muscle is done uh, by ATP, right? All right, here we have a transport protein. Um, again, we sometimes will transfer molecules against their gradient so here we have molecules that are in high concentration inside the cell. We are trying to get the solute to come in still uh, in low concentrations outside the cell. You, that requires energy to force this molecule against the gradient, right? So here we have ATP uh, phosphorylating this transport protein. Again, uh, adding that energy 
uh, or that extra source of energy required to move that solute against the gradient, right? Pushing it against that high concentration, okay? And then you have AD, ADP and a phosphate group after the work is being performed, okay? Again, uh, movement against a gradient requires energy, right? Just like move, uh, just like uh, movement of muscle fibers require energy, okay? Uh, chemical reactants performing chemical work, promoting a chemical reaction. Here we have ATP phosphorylating uh, X, and you have Y as the other reactant coming together. The addition or uh, the chemical reaction being performed will then use up that phosphorylated uh, uh, X molecule, and you'll have that uh, the expulsion of the ADP and, and phosphate group. Okay, right? This phosphate again is adding that energy required to combine the reactants together, forming X and Y, and then you have that loss of that phosphate after the addition of that Y. Okay. Again, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the energy, uh, uh, adding energy to that uh, system, uh, which will then perform that chemical reaction, okay? So ATP cycle, cellular respiration, chemical energy harvested from fuel molecules, again, will allow for the AD, AD, adenosine diphosphate to re-add that phosphate group. We'll talk about this process later uh, on Wednesday. Um, and this, again, is going to be a little more uh, in-depth on the metabolic processes of the cell, right? But today was just a, a little brief introduction. But this whole uh, ADP, again, the addition of that phosphate to the adenosine diphosphate, creating the ATP or adenosine triphosphate is a whole different process, right? And a lot of it takes place in the mitochondria of the cell, again, that powerhouse that we talked, to, uh, talked about last time, okay? Again, ATP has a potential to perform work, which is shown here. Work can be seen as either the contraction of a muscle, um, the phosphorylation of a transport protein, which will allow for the transfer of solutes in a, against a concentration gradient, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then also ATP can be used as, as uh, a molecule that can further along organic, uh, or sorry, uh, chemical reactions, okay? All right, so I just wanted to point out uh, ATP versus nucleotides, right? Adenosine triphosphate versus uh, a nucleotide, which is used in DNA, right? So nucleotides, again, are making up the DNA molecules, right? So one thing you'll note is adenosine triphosphate. So it has a ribose sugar. Uh, it has a base which is actually adenine. Adenine can be uh, also bonded here in DNA, right? We have adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, right? Adenine is a base that DNA can also utilize. But the main difference uh, is the sugar, which is a ribose sugar found in RNA. And then you have three phosphate groups, okay? Whereas here we only have one. But this is a very, very similar molecule to DNA and RNA, right? So this is DNA. RNA has the extra little OH group here, um, and he, which makes this a ribose sugar, and this is a deoxy ribose sugar, right? Because you have a, de, uh, a deoxygenated or de uh, there's no hydroxyl group here at that uh, second carbon, right? That second prime carbon here. All right, but again, very, very uh, similar structures, okay? DNA and ATP, very, very similar. Okay, just wanted to point that out so you would, uh, can recognize that biological systems uh, have very, very conserved structures uh, in their metabolic pathways, okay? All right, enzymes. So a, a molecule, usually a protein, but sometimes RNA. So RNA does have uh, um, enzyme-like properties, which we'll talk about later when we get into to RNA and ribosomes. Ribosomes are where you see much of this uh, enzymatic uh, RNA or enzyme-like RNA. Uh, this that serves as a biological catalyst, changing the rate of a chemical reaction without itself being changed in the process. Okay, so what does this mean? So there's no loss of enzymes. There's no loss of these proteins um, in the system when they're being used for uh, uh, the chemical reactions, which we'll, we'll sh I'll show you in a minute what that what that really looks like and what that really means. So metabolism, the total of all chemical reactions in an organism, 
um, again, enzymes will help the metabolism along or, or uh, facilitate uh, the, the metabolism. So activation energy is also important when you talk about uh, enzymes. So the amount of energy that is required uh, to perform that chemical reaction, right? Um, so think of the combustion engine, right? You have to add a small amount of energy in order to combust that fuel. Um, that spark plug is, is shooting an electrical uh, uh, spark through the gas that's uh, sprayed into the engine block, right? That spark plug will then trigger that flame to occur. Uh, think of this activation energy also if you have a gas stove, you have the little clicker, you turn the clicker over and it, it creates a, a small little spark that ignites the flame, causing that chemical reaction to occur, right? Uh, another form of the chemical reaction being added in, a, in a, a cell is through ATP. This is an activation energy. This gives this, these reactants the, uh, the energy required to fuse together or uh, make the product, the X and the Y, right? This phosphorylation event or the addition of the phosphate, this P here, will then make the reactants turn into products, right? This is an energy process, right? This transfer of the phosphate is an energy process or an energetic process that allows for this to occur. That is the exact same thing as adding the spark to light your stove or the spark to combust your engine or the flame uh, that adds uh, that you take to your, um, let's say a firework, right? You're adding this, this energy source that's going to eventually combust or produce that, that, uh, uh, that uh, desired um, outcome, right? Okay. So activation energy is the initial uh, energy investment. Okay. Um, and we'll see this in glycolysis later on Wednesday. But again, this is probably the simplest way I can explain it. Enzymes and activation energy. Also, feel free to ask questions. I know I, I usually stop and see if anyone has any questions, but feel free to uh, ask questions if you have any. Okay. Um, so enzymes and activation energy. Activation energy, again, is the energy barrier uh, without the enzyme. What happens if you add the enzyme? This barrier is removed. The amount of energy required to perform this reaction is going to be much less, okay? So you need to get to a certain level of energy in order to perform this. Without an enzyme, a reactive molecule must overcome this activation energy barrier before a chemical reaction can break the molecule into products, right? Without an enzyme, this may never be reached, okay? Um, this barrier might be extremely high uh, to, to break apart these products or this reactant into products, okay? Uh, but with an enzyme, this can be removed or lowered, right? This enzyme will lower the activation energy and therefore less, less energy is required to break down the products. Therefore, this is not used up. This just brings the products uh, uh, or this actually just pushes that chemical reaction over into the products, right? Uh, uh, favoring uh, this process to occur, right? So an enzyme speeds up the chemical reaction by lowering the activation energy barrier, and that's it. This is not used up. Uh, this is allowed to convert into the products, uh, and this is an energy energetically favorable uh, reaction after the addition of the enzyme, okay? So enzyme activity. So we have something called a substrate. So this is a specific substance reactant uh, on uh, which an enzyme reacts. Uh, each enzyme recognizes only the specific substrate if the reaction uh, of, uh, I guess I, that's a typo there, of the reaction it catalyzes, okay? So very specific substrates for uh, enzymes, right? You have very specific uh, chemical products. So again, this will be the substrate, the enzyme will bind and then uh, convert that into the product. So we have an active site, the part of an enzyme molecule where a substrate molecule attaches typically a pocket or groove on the enzyme surface, right? And remember, enzymes are uh, made of protein or in ribosomes, they can be made of, of uh, RNA as well, okay? They have something called an induced fit. So this is where the protein and the substrate uh, bind to each other perfectly to lower that activation energy, right? 
the integration between a substrate molecule and the active site of an enzyme, which changes shape slightly to embrace the substrate and catalyst uh, and catalyze the reaction, right? So the induced fit just means that if, uh, if the enzyme is my hand and the chemical reaction would be to click a pin, the hand would need to change shape in order to click that pin, right? And that is exactly what the enzyme is doing. It's wrapping itself around whatever the reactants are and then inducing the change of that uh, substrate, right? So either breaking them apart or causing a change in shape in that molecule, okay? So that's important, right? So here we have lactase. This is the enzyme that is required to break down lactose or uh, catabolize, cat 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 sorry, break down the lactose molecule uh, into its two different sugars, right? We have glucose and galactose here, right? So this is uh, the enzyme lactase. It comes into contact with the substrate lactose. Uh, lactose then binds to the enzyme at the active site. Uh, this induced fit will then cause uh, the lowering of the activation energy of that molecule, right? Water is added again into that system because we have hydrolysis. The hydro, uh, remember the water breaking, uh, or the, the addition of water for the breakdown of that covalent bond. Um, again, the products are released and lactose can accept another molecule of the substrate, right? So again, if that's done, right, the, oops, the uh, lactose is broken down into two sugars, then you, this enzyme is free to uh, bind to another substrate, another lactose molecule, okay? Uh, remember, the addition of water is extremely important. You need to remember that uh, for the exam, right? Hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis, right? The uh, hydrolysis is the addition of water. Again, this is the same thing here. Uh, addition of water to break down those covalent bonds. Uh, whereas if you were to uh, fuse glucose and galactose together, you would have uh, um, a dehydration uh, synthesis, right? So the addition of these two sugars together or the linkages between a, uh, with the covalent bond will remove water away, okay? Or uh, at, uh, yeah, remove water out of that system. Okay, yeah. And lactase, uh, again, uh, you can take uh, uh, lactase pills. Uh, individuals that are lactose intolerant will usually uh, take a pill or, or two before they actually eat ice cream or milk, again, to break down the lactose in dairy products. So this enzyme is readily sold. There is a milk called lactate, I believe, and they actually add the enzyme lactase to that milk to break down uh, the uh, lactose sugar, okay? Um, one thing you'll note about that, that, uh, that milk is that that milk will probably taste a little bit sweeter because you have glucose molecule rather than lactose, okay? So you have a different uh, uh, flavor or a different type of sugar that's present there, okay? Uh, enzyme inhibitors. So enzyme inhibitors, and actually, um, just a quick little snippet about that. This actually uh, preserves that milk a little bit longer too. Lactose is easily fermented or... Uh, is used by certain types of molecule or certain types of uh, organisms, microbial organisms. That lactase actually, uh, when it breaks the glucose and or make, breaks that lactose and the glucose and galactose provides a an extra uh, longer or provides a little bit longer shelf life, just because there's certain microorganisms in uh, in uh, the milk that prefer that lactose. Okay, so just a weird little, I guess, tangent there. All right, so enzyme inhibitors, uh, a chemical that interferes with an enzyme's activity by changing the enzyme shape, either by plugging up the active site or by binding to another site on the enzyme, okay? So you'll have competitive and non-competitive inhibitors, which, I'll, which we'll talk about right now. So this is a normal binding of that enzyme and that substrate. Again, this induced fit, you will have the binding here. The induced fit, the enzyme will wrap around that molecule changing the structure, lowering the activation energy, and then you'll get like a byproduct after this, okay? There, here we have something called a competitive inhibitor. Just think of this as a substrate, oops, a substrate imposter, right? So an inhibitor will come and bind to the surface stronger than the, the substrate will bind to this enzyme. Therefore, it will prevent uh, the chemical reaction from occurring because 
there is something bound to the active site. Okay. Um, this is, uh, you can see this is typically a drug or some sort of toxin. Uh, this is common for uh, people to have uh, this blocking uh, and prevention of, of the substrate from occurring or binding to that uh, enzyme. Okay. Um, what is it? Acetyl CoA. Yeah. Well, yeah. So we'll talk about that. I guess well, this is a good example. So think of uh, uh, there's a bacteria that produces uh, or a, a bacteria called botulinum uh, or Clostridium botulinum. Okay. Um, and that is considered a competitive inhibitor of nerve, nervous and nerve tissue or nerve endings, right? Um, and that will bind, uh, that toxin binds to the ends of nerves that prevents uh, the nerve from firing, okay? Um, and there are enzymes that are, are, are proteins that are present there uh, that have enzymatic capabilities that actually clear out those, those uh, molecules when a nerve is fired, right? It goes through and it actually uh, uh, frees up that nerve again to uh, refire, resend that signal. Okay, uh, and something that uh, Clostridium does really well is bind to nerve endings. Their toxins can bind to nerve endings, therefore preventing the enzymes from uh, resetting the nerve uh, and and uh, making it able to refire again. Right. So one of the enzymes will actually, or one of the toxins that Clostridium makes, uh, tetanus, causes lockjaw. So that will bind to the nerve and it will bind to it and cause it to constantly be contracted or constantly be firing. You have the contraction of the muscle. Again, that muscle uh, will, will lock, causing lockjaw, right? So anyone that's ever gotten a tetanus shot, right? They talk about lockjaw and being infected by a puncture wound, right? If you step on a nail, they tell you to go to the hospital and get a tetanus shot. Um, again, that organism causes uh, this toxin to form and bind to this, these, the nerve endings at the, uh, that will, won't allow this enzyme to work and, and actually reset that nerve, right? So if you have a constant firing of that nerve, you have the lockjaw. Well, botul botulinum toxin fu functions in the same way. But instead of causing that nerve to, to completely fire, causing the muscles to contract, um, you have the relaxation of the muscles. And you have the inability to clear out uh, um, the uh, neurotransmitter uh, in that area. So those proteins are used or, or cannot work or cannot perform that function. Okay? Um, what you have there is a relaxation of the nerves, a relaxation of the muscles because the nerves are unable to fire. Right? And botulinum toxin, toxin is actually used in cosmetics, right? Think of uh, Botox. So Botox, think of this as a competitor, competitive inhibitor uh, or an inhibitor of the protein. So it, it prevents the, the molecules from actually being released, okay? All right. So here we have the active site uh, and an inhibitor. Here, this inhibitor is actually a non-competitive inhibitor. So what this means is this non-competitive inhibitor binds to a different site on that enzyme that prevents the substrate from binding. What happens here, oops, uh, with this inhibitor is it binds to this area in a non-competitive site, but upon binding to this enzyme, you have the changing of the shape of that enzyme. So the active site is changed slightly. It does not allow that substrate to bind to that active site. Therefore, you don't have that chemical reaction taking place, okay? Um, so yeah, different than here where you have the inhibitor binding to that, that active site. So it just competes with the substrate. This does not compete with the substrate. A lot of drugs uh, are, uh, are utilized this way. So you'll have like different types of antibiotics, uh, different types of drugs that uh, affect uh, uh, the body in this way. Okay, so through competitive and non-competitive uh, inhibitors, okay? So both nerve gas and insecticides work by uh, crippling uh, a vital enzyme. Again, the nerve gas is very similar to what I mentioned earlier with uh, clostridium, botulinum, or Botox, and uh, the tetanus toxin. Um, these, this nerve gas or these insecticides work by preventing uh, 
uh, the, uh, the removal or preventing those enzymes and those nerve endings to actually uh, allow for the clearing out of the neurotransmitter, therefore preventing the firing of that nerve signal. Okay, So this is, again, similar to uh, uh, what you would see there with Botox or uh, tetanus. Okay? You have the loss of function in, in uh, nerve gas of, of certain uh, muscles or the upper respiratory tract or your heart, right? Um, and same thing with certain insecticides. They work by, by inhibiting that organism's uh, use of, of uh, neural tissue, okay? So preventing normal functioning of that body, right? And again, these are uh, uh, non-competitive and competitive inhibitors of uh, vital enzymes that are found in the body, okay? Um, yeah. That's, yeah, that's probably a good explanation there. All right. So here we have a primary function of membranes. An actual cell may have a few uh, of the types of protein shown here, and many copies of each particular protein may be present. Okay, so membranes have various different embedded proteins. Um, here we have an enzymatic activity shown. This protein and the one next to it are enzymes having an active site that fits a substrate enzyme, uh, may form from an assembly line, and carries out steps of a pathway. Okay, so again, the passage of different molecules through that, uh, that enzyme. We have cell signaling. This is important in immune cells, right? So we have like MHC2 complexes. This is important for identifying pathogens in the body, uh, identifying viruses, bacteria, fungi, uh, other cells in the body, right? It can recognize self through this mechanism. Uh, something binds here, such as like a virus or a uh, uh, bacterial protein, you have a signal that's being uh, uh, sent off in the body, forming a, uh, performing a different metabolic function. Okay. You have attachment proteins. Again, this binds to different uh, uh, cytoskeleton and extracellular matrix. Um, again, help maintain the shell structure and shape. Uh, you have intracellular joining proteins that may link adjacent cells. And then you have cell-to-cell -cell recognition. This is like MHC1 complex. Uh, this is going to be uh, important for growth uh, development, right? This is also very important for uh, cancer uh, identification of body, right? Again, if, you're, if you have cancer cells, they may not display these proteins or this uh, sugar or protein here. Uh, therefore, your body will not recognize it as self and should destroy that cell, right? So passive transport and diffusion across membranes. We have diffusion, the spontaneous movement of particles of any kind down a concentration gradient. That is movement of particles from where there are more concentrated to where they are less concentrated, okay? So movement from, movement from concentrated to least concentrated or less concentrated is a, a passive process, which means there's no, there shouldn't be any energy that's needed to move that or allow that to occur, okay, right? Think of a bathtub and you have a big bathtub and you dump in a dye. That dye will automatically um, disperse uh, naturally throughout um, or d diffuse or uh, disperse throughout that bath water, okay? Uh, same thing if you add, if you're making like a soft drink or like a Kool-Aid, you dump in that packet of Kool-Aid. It doesn't take much for that dye to mix in that water, right? It'll disperse evenly throughout that water. And that's diffusion, right? The gradient wants to be reached, right? There wants to be uh, um, even amounts of that, dis uh, that, that dye or that, that drink dispersed in that water, okay? So there's not much energy required to do that. There's no energy required to do that. Whereas uh, we'll talk about uh, active uh, transport, which requires energy. So passive transport is the fusion of a substance across a biological membrane without any input of energy, okay? Facilitated diffusion, the passage of a substance across a biological membrane down its concentration gradient, aided by specific transport proteins, which transport proteins are found here, right? They can help, uh, or they allow larger molecules to pass through that membrane, okay? Facilitated diffusion is the passage of a substance across a biological membrane down its concentration gradient, aided by uh, uh, transport proteins. Oh, it just, I think I just read that one. Sorry, that was this one, the transport protein one. 
Okay, concentration gradient and, and increase or decrease in the density of a chemical substance within a given region, right? So uh, think of a concentration gradient as uh, like salt across a other part of the membrane, right? We the salt will allow for or be higher concentration outside the cell, let's say in a salty environment, right? Um, and that, that salt wants to diffuse or be pulled into that cell. Uh, again, again, that's a concentration gradient, increased salt on the outside, less salt on the inside. Uh, and you'll have various different pathologies or various different cell functions based on that, right? Maintaining that gradient or um, letting that, that gradient uh, equal out or, or go, go to equilibrium, which will be even amounts of solute, okay? All right. So passive transport diffusion across the membrane. A substance will diffuse from where it is most concentrated to where it is less concentrated. Put, to put it another way, a, uh, a substance tends to diffuse down its concentration gradient, right? So here we have a concentration gradient. Uh, molecules of dye, think of that dye in the bathtub or your, uh, your cup of, of Kool-Aid that you're gonna make, right? You have molecules that are initially present uh, and this is a gradient, and this is increased molecules of dye here. This eventually would prefer to disperse to that other side again to lower that gradient to evenly disperse those molecules out. This membrane will only allow certain amounts of particles in. And then um, this, uh, these molecules will then transfer through both sides of that membrane. Uh, forming an equilibrium. An equilibrium just means that there's equal amounts of this dye on both sides of that membrane, okay, um, which is important. Our, the membrane in the cell is selectively permeable. So again, we may need to have uh, a, a transport protein that allows these molecules to pass in and out. Uh, but again, an e equilibrium is desired, right? This is, this is energetically favorable. So this is, uh, typically uh, desired right here, right? Every now and then you'll have different concentration gradients, uh, especially in uh, organisms that are in fresh or saltwater environments. Uh, typically, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But again, equilibrium is always desired by the cell. So passive transport of one type of molecule, the membrane is permeable to these dye, dye molecules, which diffuse down the concentration gradient at equilibrium the molecules are still uh, restless, but the rate of trans, uh, transport of it uh, is equal in both directions, right? So at equilibrium, there's equal amounts of that dye on both sides of the membrane, whereas in the initial addition of dye, you have dye on the outside, and then you have the diffusion of those molecules uh, eventually inside, uh, causing or uh, allowing for that equilibrium to be reached, okay? Um, here we have passive transport of two types of molecules. If solutions have two or more solutes, each will diffuse down its own concentration gradient, okay? Again, here we have uh, the mixing or the transfer of the red dye out and the blue dye in, again, making the equilibrium, okay? Eventually, these will equal out if you have, uh, if this membrane is permeable to each of these molecules, okay? Uh, osmosis and water balance. Osmosis, the diffusion of water across the selectively permeable membrane. Again, think of the part of the membrane. Solute, a substance that is dissolved in a liquid, which is called the solvent, right, to form a solution. Solutes are whatever is present in water. Uh, if you have water, you mix dirt into the water. The dirt is the solute, okay? If you have a, a fresh or uh, water to cook pasta in, if you put the salt and the pasta, the salt and the pasta are gonna be your solutes, right? Where the water is going to be that uh, solvent. So a hypertonic solution is in comparing two solutions, referring to the one with the greater concentration of solutes, okay? So hypertonic here would be this side of the solution. This is hypotonic. Therefore, the hypertonic solution will want that, will push the solutes over or this will suck water over on the other side of that membrane if these are not permeable, which we'll talk about in a minute. Hypotonic in comparing two solutions, referring to 
uh, the one with lower concentration of solutes, right? So hypotonic would be this right here, less concentration of solutes. This is hypotonic to the hypertonic exterior here, okay? Uh, isotonic are equal amounts of solutes, which is at equilibrium. So you have it here and here. Uh, membrane or uh, osmosis, this is a membrane that separates two solutions with different sugar concentrations. Water molecules can pass through the membrane, but the sugar molecules cannot. Okay, so what we have here is showing that a hypertonic solution actually per per produces high levels of, of, of movement of water, also known as uh, high dissolved solutes. Uh, high dissolved solutes will uh, attract water, right? So this is, uh, think of that, that term that I told you earlier uh, when we looked at cells, salt sucks. So solutes will suck water uh, towards uh, the hypertonic uh, uh, solution, right? So you have the equal amounts of water here. You have dissolved uh, solutes here, which is the sugar. Okay, and again, this, this barrier, this membrane, uh, prevents the sugars from passing through. Otherwise, this will evenly disperse, and then you'll have uh, you'll have uh, equilibrium reached, right? But equilibrium cannot be reached by the solutes because of this barrier. So therefore, equilibrium must be reached by the water. Okay. So osmosis reduces the difference in sugar concentrations and changes the volumes of the two solutions. Uh, equilibrium concentrations. Uh, uh, of solute, this is an isotonic uh, uh, solution now, both sides, right? Um, and the best way I can explain this is that salt sucks. Salt will suck water uh, out of that solution. Again, think of that example when I told you about cells. Uh, when you go swimming, uh, it's, much, it's much more difficult to, uh, or it's much more detrimental to, to drown in fresh water than it is salt water. Again, because that fresh water is, has less solutes, right? And if you drown in that water, your cells have more solutes and that water will travel into the cells causing itself to rupture, okay? Um, another uh, uh, example of this too is think of, of things that have less, hmm, let me put it into perspective here something that we noticed yeah just think of think of this as anytime you have increased solutes you need to balance out the uh the amount of, of salt that's present in the water right um and again this is favorable because be, not, the water pressure is not enough to overcome uh the the the, the equilibrium right the equilibrium is it has much more pull here in terms of where the water is going to travel. Okay, uh, water will like to reach equilibrium in solute concentrations. Again, this is why it's important uh, to consider this am among cells and uh, uh, treatment strategies and, and individuals. Uh, when you're injecting something into someone's body, you need to have a salt concentration, right? If you inject pure water into somebody, uh, let's say through an IV. Um, you can have the destruction of cells by this mechanism because your cells have salt, your, sol your cells have solutes in them. Uh, again, uh, may, that may cause the cells to rupture due to the osmotic pressure, okay? It has increased osmotic pressure, so increased water flow, okay? Um, and here's a nice example of that, okay? So here we have a hypertonic solution. So if you remembered, I talked about this is you, uh, an individual drowning in uh, uh, the ocean, okay? So if you drown in the ocean, the cells in your lungs will shrivel because the ocean is much saltier than your body, okay? Again, this will be the ocean and the sucking of the water or pulling the water. You'll have the, the loss of water here to meet the equilibrium, okay? showing the shriveled cells here you have the shriveled cell the uh the plant or the yeah the plant cell here which will which will be shriveled inside of its cellulose uh, cell wall okay we have a hypotonic solution right um in plant cells this is fine right so if you have the increased pressure the tonicity 
of that plant, you have a very, uh, very, very turgid uh, plant. So that plant will be standing upright, okay? Here you have, let's say this was a cell in your lung, if you drown in a freshwater swimming pool, you have that increased pressure on that cell, again, causing that pop to occur, right? The, the lysis, right? So think of this as the fresh water and the cell in your body, uh, the water will flow into that cell, causing it to pop, right? Isotonic, everyone's happy except for the plant. Plants are flaccid and limp, but isotonic solutions in the body are required. This is why people that have or are on an IV drip and that require fluids get 0.9% saline solution rather than pure water. You cannot inject pure water into your body. This will occur, the lysis, right? You need to inject 0.9% saline solution, which you'll see on your drip bag if you've ever been in a hospital, if you've ever seen those drips, okay? So keep that in mind. So osmoregulation, the control of the gain or loss of water and dissolved solutes in an organism. Cells must control the dissolved solutes or become isotonic to their environment, okay? Uh, fish do this often. Fish have to do this. Sea lions actually need to do this, right? Sea lions are mammals. They have 0.9% saline solution just as we do, uh, but they live in a, in a dehydrating environment, right? The ocean is going to constantly be dehydrating them. Uh, so where do they get their, their water from? They can't drink uh, salt water, actually through their food. So sea lions get uh, their, their liquid actually from the fish they consume, okay? Um, fish also have to regulate their salt concentrations, right? So fish can actually expel excess salts um, through various uh, means of their body, right? Um, uh, certain uh, seabirds can also do this as well. They have salt glands. They can secrete, uh, they can uh, get rid of salt from their environment. Uh, again, very, very different means of doing this, especially in the ocean where it's, the ocean is essentially a dehydrating environment. The ocean is a desert. Uh, Okay, so we have, uh, again, a wilted plant and a, a, a turgid plant. So again, this is at isotonic or in hypertonic uh, uh, solutions, right? So this is a plant cell. Uh, again, this is the plant cell flaccid at normal isotonic levels. And then we have a watered plant that, that the vacuole is completely full with water. That plant cell is nice and uh, tight, again, uh, allowing that plant to stand upright, okay? So active transport, the pumping of molecules across membranes. Uh, active transport, the movement of a substance across uh, a biological membrane against its concentration gradient, aided by specific transport proteins and requiring the input of energy, often as ATP. Okay, so active transport, again, requires ATP, right? We have the phosphorylation of this uh, protein, uh, bind that molecule and pull it in against its concentration gradient, right? So energetically, this is not desired, right? Uh, our bodies or our cells will produce this or allow this to occur by adding ATP, right? Think of this. this. These molecules want to leave the cell because it's against the concentration gradient. Therefore, we require uh, the pumping or the moving of the molecules inside the cell into the, high, into the higher concentration gradient. So this requires energy, whereas the other processes did not, right? The other processes were going with the concentration gradient, right? Moving those particles in or out depending on uh, the gradient, okay? So uh, exocytosis is endocytosis. So this is a traffic of large molecules. So exocytosis is the movement of materials out of the cytoplasm of a cell uh, via membranous vesicles or vacuoles. Endocytosis, the movement of materials from the external environment into the cytoplasm of the cell via vesicles or vacuoles, okay? Phagocytosis, cellular eating, a type of endocytosis, right? Whereby a cell engulfs larger molecules or other cells or particles in the cytoplasm. Your immune system or your immune cells will, will perform phagocytosis, right? Your white cells, as we call them, will engulf pathogens in, through this mechanism, right? They'll surround them and eat the pathogens and destroy them, okay? All right, so exocytosis, uh, this is showing a vacuole filled up with molecules to be dumped out into the outside of the cell. You have this 
vesicle that fuses ooh, excuse me to the me plasma membrane remember this membrane is self-sealing and what does self-sealing mean that it will uh, uh the membrane can can either fuse or uh, be removed and then it will the, these phospholipid uh, heads and tails again it will be fused together and, and cover that uh, that junction or that clipping in that cell membrane all right so here we have uh, the vesicle fuse and then the dumping of the molecule out into the environment this can be waste products this can be uh, uh, cellular byproducts or cellular toxins or um, yeah, it could be anything like mucus, uh, secretions from the cell. Uh, this can be done by exocytosis, okay? Um, but yeah. So removal of things outside of that cell. Endocytosis or bringing in or inside uh, is uh, accruing these little molecules into an invagination. So this is an invagination of that membrane, again, forming that vesicle. Uh, vesicle uh, the pulling into that into the cell and then eventually that bud of the vesicle and then you'll have this fuse and this is like a few food molecule you'll have it fuse with uh, um, uh, different uh, organelles inside that cell that will digest it right um, we have what is it lysosomes and then we have peroxisomes if these are toxins or uh, pathogens right uh, but our, our cells can then process this inside of, of, uh, of, that, of that cytoplasm. And then you'll have either the use of, of these molecules in metabolic pathways for energy or, or various other functions of the cell. Okay. All right. And that is it for today. Okay. Any questions? Any questions regarding... Uh, this uh, uh lecture no okay we'll talk about um your fermentation uh i guess the fermentation lab i'm gonna go through it a little bit i know i've i've told you i was gonna let you figure it out on your own but um this one It's kind of uh, different. Okay, so what you have here uh, today is going to be uh, okay. So what you're going to have here is actually uh, a couple of different things that you need to complete. Watch this video. Um, read about this. This is going to be important for Wednesday's uh, uh, discussion or uh, lecture. Uh, we'll be talking about. Uh, different metabolic pathways then okay um what you're essentially going to have is this is kind of a complex lab so you're only going to have one lab for uh today that's due on i believe it's on thursday uh, but you're going to essentially be adding yeast to this uh these containers as well as these different sugars um, and you're going to see what yeast prefers okay um, and what you're going to do is have uh, the measurement of gas that's being produced by the yeast um, in these uh, inverted tubes. And what happens is the tubes will be displaced if yeast perform um, different functions or perform their, their fermentation process. So the big thing about fermentation is that it must be an anoxic environment. What that means is oxygen cannot be present. So if um, I don't know if anyone is no, knows anything about brewing or how beer is created, but this is essentially how beer is made. Okay. You, uh, have the yeast, you have a sugar source and you, you limit the yeast on what they're able to perform and use. Okay. Um, in this case, we limit the yeast, uh, in oxygen. You have this environment in an anaerobic environment. What that means is oxygen is completely removed, and that's important for fermentation, right? Fermentation is going to be uh, the use of different sugar molecules and metabolic functioning uh, of that yeast molecule or that yeast organism without the use of oxygen, right? We cannot do this. We cannot ferment uh, uh, without, well, 
I'm saying that, but we can't ferment. We do ferment in our muscles uh, when we perform anaerobic functions, uh, right? So like think of heavy weightlifters, things like that. But we do something called lactic acid fermentation, okay? Um, and again, that's where most people say we get sore, uh, our muscles get sore from, but it's actually from a different mechanism, but don't worry about that. Uh, but yeast are a little bit different than us in that they can live in long periods of time uh, for a long period of time through f fermentation, right? They're single-celled organisms. They can function just fine uh, anaerobically. But what happens uh, through this functioning of yeast and anaerobic environment or the breakdown of sugar, they form alcohol. So they have alcohol fermentation, okay? So their byproduct is actually alcohol. When we ferment or humans uh, do some uh, perform anaerobic uh, respiration or anaerobic, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have anaerobic, but they perform from our muscles perform a fermentation, right? Let's say if we run sprints and um, again, sprints are an, an, anaerobic uh, uh, movement, right? We have something called lactic acid forming in our muscles, right? And this is when our muscles work without the use or without the presence of oxygen, right? You can jog much longer than you can sprint, okay? Again, and in sprinting, you can sprint for 20 minutes and be completely sore the next day if you're sprinting very, very hard, right? Uh, whereas you can jog for 30 minutes and not be sore at all, okay? That soreness, uh, again, is typically associated with the lactic acid production, right? Yeast will ferment in a different way. They'll perform, they'll, do uh, alcoholic fermentation. And again, we are just measuring in this lab the amount of fermentation that occurs by the carbon dioxide byproduct uh, through that fermentation process, okay? Uh, we'll measure it uh, with these, uh, let me see if I can actually see it. Shift control. So here's actually where you'll, you'll measure uh, the, the tubes. You have these inverted tubes, right? Um, and if fermentation occurs, this is an anaerobic environment, this tube will drop and you'll have the gases uh, going through, okay? Just make sure you fill out the lab. Uh, this one might be a little more complex, but the instructions are all here. Um, and you're going to be measuring the amount of, of the bubble, as well as the different sugars that are, that are introduced here. Uh, we'll talk more about fermentation on Wednesday, and I'll give you a little more uh, in-depth explanation of what this is, okay? Um, any questions about this? Again, please read the instructions, please read the introduction to that lab in order to perform it. But again, you're essentially measuring fermentation or the use of the ability for yeast to ferment different types of sugars or uh, a polysaccharide, which we're using starch here, okay? Um, but again, please email me if you have any questions about the lab. Um, this one's a little more complex, but this will be a nice uh, uh, introduction to what's gonna be going on on uh, Wednesday, okay? Uh, there's a couple of questions as well. There's about seven questions that are five points. So the questions are a little bit shorter. Um, but the lab is, is, is a little bit longer. So you only have one, okay? You only have one lab uh, to do, to get done uh, on Thursday, by Thursday, and then I'll, I'll assign a different lab on uh, Wednesday when we meet, okay? Any questions? All right, well,